How do you become a psychology professor? Stick around and let's talk about the five steps that you need to take to achieve your dream on this episode of Navigating Academia. What's up everybody, my name is Dr. J. Phoenix Singh and I want to warmly welcome you to this episode of Navigating Academia, your leading source for guidance on how to be able to advance your career in academia. As always, I appreciate the love, so please do take a second to like and share this video with your friends, with your colleagues, with your students, maybe even with your kids. Subscribe to our channel and hit that bell to be able to make sure that you get notifications every time we upload new content. Also, make sure to comment below, and if you have a sec, please do follow us on these social media accounts. So today we're going to be discussing how do you become a psychology professor. Now, I totally have to admit that when I was 12 years old, this was my dream. My dream was to be a psychology professor. I wanted to be a psychologist. I wanted to be a teacher. Uh, this was something that, you know, combined both of these passions that I had. I was always the kid who loved acting. You know, I was a stand-up comic for years. Being in front of crowds was something that I always loved. I always loved learning and knowledge, and this was a way to be able to combine everything that I loved. Uh, obviously, to become a, a professor was something that seemed at the time to be kind of this crowning achievement in life, such a big deal, but I didn't really understand how it worked or what it took to be able to get that done. To be honest with you, I thought, you know, you just get a graduate degree and then you apply for a job and, and that's it. And, you know, if you're a good teacher, then you will get the job and that's not the case. It's really oversimplified and there's really discrete things that you need to establish before you can successfully apply to a place that you would actually want to teach. If you just want to teach anywhere, I'm sure it'll be a little bit more loose if you'll accept any position, but I'm sure that you're somebody who, because you're very driven, you don't want just any position, you want to be able to teach at a place you would really enjoy. So the goal of today's video is to take you through five different steps that you need to take in terms of five things you got to establish to be able to get the job done and lock down that academic position. Step one is to complete a doctoral degree. Uh, I personally have never had a professor who does not have a doctoral degree. Uh, I am sure that there are folks, wonderful folks, who've got terminal masters out there. Uh, some of them have, let's say like an MA in counseling, for example, uh, or an LCSW, so they're a licensed clinical social worker, they've got a master's in social work. They may be teaching in psychology programs, but uh, usually you end up having people with a PhD in psychology. It doesn't have to be clinical psychology, it can be social psychology, developmental psychology, uh, forensic psychology, you name it. Uh, and it depends the kind of program that uh, you know you're interested in applying for. For example, if you're really passionate about teaching, so you know developmental psychology, and you've got a forensic psychology degree, you know you're going to have to make sure that you really make the case why it is that your background is relevant to teaching those kinds of courses. Maybe, for example, uh, you know you like myself used to work in a juvenile detention center. That would provide you some justification for having the experience and the content knowledge, content mastery to be able to teach those kinds of courses. Um, now, of course, in psychology, it's not just a PhD. You can also get something called a PsyD. And I have another video where I, you know, take you through the differences between PhDs and PsyDs, and I'll be sure to link that in the description below. But in terms of, you know, these different considerations, uh, usually you don't find PsyDs as being as prevalent as PhDs uh, on especially research universities, so kind of the bigger name universities, you know, Harvard's, Princeton's, these, they call them R1, Research One universities. Uh, and one of the big reasons for this, maybe two big reasons, number one, PsyDs are comparatively much newer degrees. Uh, and number two, PsyDs focus, uh, comparatively speaking, 
taking much, much less on the research element. And because of that, PhDs are usually the ones who have the research background that usually is necessary to be able to get higher level grants. And these big name universities, oftentimes uh, people will be research professors, meaning that a large portion or all uh, of their salary is paid through grants. So literally you get the grant money or you don't have a job. Or if you got the job, you're not gonna get paid. So why would you keep the job, right? So this is really a critical thing is that uh, PhDs are who you're going to find teaching these courses, unless you're in a PsyD program. Right? If you're teaching for a PsyD program, you'll have a lot of people who are PsyDs as well, because that's a totally different world, style of education, etc., than, let's say, you know, research psychology programs. So it's just something to take into consideration. Right? So step one, though, is getting a doctoral degree. PsyD could be a little bit harder right, to be able to find the jobs, but... PhD will definitely get the job done in terms of having that degree. Obviously, not all degrees are created equal. You have better universities and worse universities. Uh, you know, usually you do a little bit of research, a little bit of asking around, you're gonna find what the reputation of your university is, if you don't already know. Step number two is to establish a publication record. Now, when I say publications, uh, really what I'm talking about here are two, maybe three things, right? The first one are peer-reviewed publications in leading academic journals. Try to publish in journals that have an impact factor, a respectable one within your field. If you're in medicine, you know, you can have impact factors of 30 and above. If you're in, let's say, forensic psychology, got an impact factor of three or four, oh my gosh, this is the best journal ever. So really just find out what impact factors are good in your field and then publish in the ones or try to with the highest impact factors. Um, yes, quantity is important. Um, yes, sometimes you have only a few publications, but they're so widely cited uh, that your H index, which is your personal impact factor, can end up being high uh, or higher than somebody who's got a few publications that are not cited very often. Uh, but really try to maximize the influence of your work, not only in terms of its practical influence to people who are kind of like out there in the field who you want to uh, to influence. So let's say that you're in you know developmental psychology, you would want to reach people actually working with kids, but you also want to influence people who are going to cite your work, who are probably going to be other researchers. So it's really a fine balance between who you're trying to influence uh, and who you're kind of actually influencing depending on your publication outlet. So peer-reviewed publications in terms of journal articles. Second one are books, like academic books, handbooks. I am not talking about books from like, you know, Random House and Penguin here. I'm not talking about Malcolm Gladwell books, right? Those have a place for sure, right? But in terms of academia, that's not the coin of the realm. Okay, uh, so you can have edited books, you can have textbooks and handbooks. These are the coin of the realm. And uh, finally, book chapters. Now, book chapters are not as good in terms of their, uh, not their quality, their quality can be amazing. But in terms of how much they mean to your record, they don't mean as much as journal articles. Uh, and the reason is, is that usually there is no, or, uh, no peer review or the peer review is done to a lesser standard. Uh, and not that it's not amazing peer review. What I'm trying to say is that uh, journal, uh, sorry, chapter, uh, chapters usually uh, are written by individuals who've been invited to write those chapters. So peer review is more to be able to say we can make the chapter better than it is to serve a gatekeeping function of letting something in or kicking something out, which is what you see with academic uh, articles. Same thing, you do have kind of leading publishers, Sage, Wiley, Oxford University Press, etc. But then you've also got lesser known publication uh, publication houses, publishing houses. And you obviously want to go with one of the more respected academic ones. Uh, I don't recommend self-publishing books. I'll do another video on self-publishing. Uh, it does make sense in a minority of cases, but usually I wouldn't do it. Uh, not if you're trying to make, you know, an academic book. It, just my recommendation as well as my experience over the past decades. Um, but yes, establishing a publication record is critical. Um, I would not count publication as a publication, something like a, a paper presentation at a conference, a newsletter article. Sometimes, you, I mean, you can say government reports, those are very respectable, but if you can, try to publish those in a journal or in a chapter. Um, that is really, you know, the, the coin of the realms, those three different uh, publication forms that I just mentioned. So you got to establish a strong publication record. If you've got three publications and you're applying for a job where uh, a lot of it is not just teaching, but a lot of it is doing research, 
you're not gonna have the record to get that job, okay? If you're te te going to a place that's like a teaching college, like they don't care about research, um, then the next thing we're going to talk about is going to be even more important. So let's jump to that. Step number three is establishing a teaching record. And what I mean by this is teaching uh, a different courses, usually it's not just one course, uh, and teaching them in such a fashion that you get reviews from students. You need the evaluations from the students about uh, you know, kind of how you did as a teacher, how much they learned, any complaints they had about you or your teaching style. Uh, this is very important. Uh, and there's a fine line because it's like, you know, you don't wanna be teaching in such a way that you're only focused on your students liking you, but at the same time, you also don't wanna alienate all your students uh, so that they're just like, you know, this guy, you know, you can tell that he cares, but you know, he's way in a appropriately, you know, like too tough on, on us and these sorts of things. It's a really fine line. Everybody has their own pedagogical style, but you need to know what your style is uh, and you need to not only embrace it, but really try to improve yourself and your teaching style over time. Uh, really practice building solid, you know, uh, curricula for your classes. Figure out what textbooks you do versus don't like to use. Figure out, you know, what system of grading you like in terms of presentations or papers or, you know, anything in between. Uh, and are you gonna use extra credit? Are you not, all these sorts of things are tiny little things that all are going to feed into your pedagogical approach. And that is something that's important for you to have mastery over because you are going to be asked questions about your teaching style. Uh, of course, this isn't very important if you're at an R1 university where, you know, you're a research professor and you're not teaching any classes. Uh, it's gonna be a lot more important uh, if not only are you, you know, in a tenure track position, da da da, but if you're like in an adjunct position where all you do is teach and you're getting paid per class, and remember that now more than ever, the majority of new positions opening are not tenure track, they're adjunct, because it's a lot cheaper to hire adjunct faculty. Kinda sucks, I know if you're somebody on the job market. Uh, but but this, is, this is a critical thing to take into consideration uh, because then your teaching record and evaluations become even more important. So make sure that you really crush that and build that record. Step number four is really critical if you are going to be a researcher of any kind, which is to establish a grant funding record. A lot of research, it, you know, it takes money to be able to just conduct the research in the first place. Maybe you need to buy materials, you need to travel to places, there, maybe you need money to be able to, you know, pay every participant a certain amount to be able to get the participants. There's so many reasons that you need money. And it's not that the university usually is going to give you money. Sometimes you get like a tiny little baby grant, especially if you're an early career professional. But if you want to do like a national study, statewide study, provincial study, whatever it is, you need money and you need to go to a grant funding body to get it. It can be a nonprofit, it can be an association, it can be uh, the government, it can be really anything, but you need to get that money. And it's, it's very important that you learn how to do that. And by establishing a, a record of getting grant money, this is really going to be something that's seen as very favorable uh, by a committee which would make the decision to you know, give you an academic position. So uh, it's something where, let's say that again, you're teaching full time, people aren't really gonna care about grants, although it would be nice, especially because this way you can teach other people how to get the grants, which is good. Um, but if it's like an R1 research university and you don't have like an incredible grant funding record, the likelihood that you're gonna get a job there is pretty low, especially if you're gonna be like a research professor, there's no chance. There's no chance. And in terms of being like a tenure track position, you better have gotten some money in the past. And again, it's not like you gotta get like, a, like, an R, uh, like an R01 or something like that. You don't have to get some huge, huge funding mechanism to fund you, or like a K1 or something like this. Uh, but it is important that uh, you show your willingness to learn how to do it. And again, if you're not the principal investigator on a grant, maybe you're like a co-PI or a co-investigator, whatever, but you gotta show your involvement with grants in some way, shape, or form. 
And number five is to establish a personal reputation. You know, it, oftentimes we forget, we think so much about focusing on our work and having our work speak for us that we forget that other academics, including the people who would hire you, are human beings. And all of us will develop a reputation in the field the more we get to know folks. The more we go to conferences, the more that we co-author pieces with new folks, uh, we're going to end up in different cliques and excluded from other cliques. Academia is very, very clicky. Um, it almost feels like high school sometimes, and there is a lot of drama. You would expect it to have no drama, be really objective and respectful and all. No, it's not. Uh, you need to, it's, it's full of human beings, and this is how human beings are, right? Um, but by establishing a reputation where you have a lot of integrity, where your work is very high quality, where you're humble and modest, uh, these are all really, you know, positive things, as well as being somebody who, uh, you know, gets things done on time and works well with others. You're a good team player. These are all great things that people could say about you that will make you more likely to, to get a job. So those are the five key steps. After that, obviously, you know, you got to apply for open positions, which you got to find in the first place, and then you got to interview, so on and so forth. You know, that's the whole process of, of applying, and maybe we'll do another video on that. If you'd like a video like that, let me know in the comments below. But in terms of where to look, I would look at places like higheredjobs.com, Chronicle of Higher Education has a job board. You can just talk to colleagues and mentors about if they've heard of any open positions. Uh, and let's say there's a department, you don't know anybody there, you don't hear anything, you know, ever, there's nothing online. There is nothing wrong with just calling the department and asking if there's any open positions. Uh, there's really nothing wrong with that. Usually, you don't even have to say your name. You can just call and be like, hi there, you know, I'm a, currently a professor at such and such. Uh, I know this is random, but I wasn't quite sure who to speak with. Uh, but I was wondering whether or not there happened to be any open faculty positions right now. And if there are, fantastic. And if there's not, then there's not. But, you know, at least you know. Uh, and sometimes you do have to take that straightforward approach. If you'd like to learn more about the job application process, though, uh, you know, definitely let me know. We can chat about it. All right, y'all, thank you so much for joining me for this episode. Uh, I definitely want to hear from you in the comments below. Uh, why is it your dream to be a psychology professor? How long have you been thinking about it? And do you have kind of a dream university, dream department where you'd really like to teach? Uh, and why is it that the place that you'd really like to be? As always, if you have ideas for future episodes, I'd love to hear them. So please just comment below and uh, we'll definitely try to answer your questions because that's the reason that we're here is for you. Don't forget to like and share this video with your friends, with your colleagues and your students. Follow us on social media. And if you're interested in one-on-one -on -one career mentoring and coaching, please do sign up coaching session with me via the website below. And let's talk about what your dreams are and how we can make them a reality. Signing off everybody. Thank you so much for watching again. And I hope you have a great day. Remember to get out there, take chances and be your best self. Thank you so much for stopping by everyone. It's a pleasure to have you here as always. If you enjoyed this video and you'd like to see more in this series on navigating academia, please click on one of these links over here to be able to view more original content. I hope to see you there.